Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the Hurricane Laura discussion show. I'm your host, Jim Williams. You know why I'm here tonight? Uh, serious situation unfolding for the northern Gulf Coast. Uh, normally I do not cover tropical storms, category ones, uh, you know, occasionally a Category 2, and especially if I'm in it, if it's if it's my area, of course, I'll cover it no matter what it is. But um, this is going to be a very serious situation for the northern Gulf Coast. Now, I've heard comparisons to Rita. I'm going to get into some of the differences between those two systems, between Laura and Rita. While this will be extremely bad for the northern Gulf Coast and deadly, um, it's, it's a little bit, it's different than Rita and I'll get to the details. So anyway, I'm going to be with you tonight from now until about 11 PM when the 11 PM advisory comes out from the national hurricane center, I'll pull up the herd track program and we'll go through it step by step on what the timing is on this. And it's going to hit in the nighttime. I know it's a terrible situation. Uh, nighttime hurricanes are scary no matter what category they are. But when you put up a Category 3, Category 4, and you're out there 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, the latest indications are this is going to be probably 3 a.m., uh, maybe 2 a.m. where the eye wall begin, it comes on shore, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., it finally begins to pull out of the area, wherever that, that landfall point is. But the surge is going to linger. A lot of buildings are going to go underwater. It's going to be really ugly on the uh, northwest Gulf Coast. So we'll get into the specifics on where it's going exactly. Um, I'm going to talk about the models, the best performing models. And I'm going to run them here so you can see who's done the best up to this point and where those models think it's going to go. And that's always a fun thing to do. We take all the best track data at Hurricane City and calculate it on a day by day by day basis. So you can go out five weeks, five, five, five weeks, five days to a week and kind of see where, uh, who, what models are improving and which models are getting worse with time. I'll go over that. I'm going to go over the current environment in the Gulf of Mexico, the favorable environment, but there are some little bit of things that could disrupt the circulation. And I also want to touch on land systems that travel over land and then hit water. Sometimes water isn't always a hurricane's best friend. I know that sounds absurd, but I'm going to give you a whole host of examples of systems that were over land for an extended period of time. They hit the water and they just didn't know what to do. It was like they were left, uh, like their mama let go of their hand and they didn't know what to do as soon as they got out over the water. I mean, it really, it, it, there's, it's inexplainable why that happens, but it has happened with certain tropical systems. So let's hope that happens with this, where this doesn't become a major hurricane, but I think it will become a major hurricane. But let's, so anyway, let's go back to when this all started. And I, I've been doing this since 97 online, and I've been doing it a lot longer than that as a kid in middle school, keeping track of these things, doing video, audio recordings and keeping track of how the, uh, systems are out in the Atlantic and I track them and I have this big huge tracking chart that's up on the wall over here and uh, I've been doing this since I was a kid so I've, I've been doing this a long time and I've, I've seen this act play out before so I can kind of speak from a little bit of experience but uh, I want to touch first on the media the media has been this has been of course the media does what the media does um, the media, what they like to do is take 
everything and blow it out of proportion. You know this. Um, from politics uh, all to natural disasters and everything else. Now, we're dealing with this COVID-19, and this is by far the bigger story than anything this hurricane season could dish out. We've had 10,600 people die in Florida. There's no hurricane that will ever kill 10,600 people in Florida. I, I can safely say, and the reason I can safely say that is we have evacuation processes where people can get out of the area. We have transportation. We have public transportation. People can get out of these areas. Um, the people that stay behind tend to be have well-built homes. They might be outside of a surge zone, so they stay put. But you know, I don't think we're ever going to see. I mean, we saw Katrina, 15, I think it's 1,800 people that died. And a lot of people stay behind, uh, but that's a very vulnerable storm surge area. But I don't think, even no matter, if we had a Category 6 going to New York City, I don't think we're going to see 10,000 people die, not to mention 170,000 people die, which is what we had happen in the United States this year. So I just want to put this in perspective, is what we're looking at here with, with Hurricane Laura and what we've dealt with with COVID is a completely different ballgame. And I don't mean to downplay Laura tonight, but this is, there are people that are going to die. This I can tell you, it, it, I don't want to sound like Trump when I say that, but I I know from experience there will be at least a couple of people that will die at the minimum from Laura over the next 36 to 48 hours. There have already been people that have died in the Caribbean from Tropical storm flooding uh, the uh, in Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It's a mountainous region, so you, the, the sky opens up, dumps on the mountains. The water flows down the mountains, and you have flooding water flowing down the streets, sweep, sweeping people out of their houses. Um, that happens in the Caribbean with the mountainous regions and Cuba as well. So we've already had a death toll. I think it's up to like 20 or something. I, I'm not exactly sure at this moment, how many people have died, but uh, will there be people that will die in the United States from Laura? Yes. P more than likely, somebody is not going to leave. They're going to be stuck in the surge zone, like we saw with Ike in 2008. We saw the Boulevard Peninsula, which is a lot of houses on stilts. A lot of people stayed there. They, they thought they could ride it out, and the storm surge knocked everything down. It, it just completely obliterated the Boulevard Peninsula. This also happened in Hurricane Rita in 2005. And I'm going to show you some before and after pictures that are going to blow your mind of what happened in Cameron, Louisiana, and the coastal towns in, in southwest Louisiana from Rita. So there, it's going to be bad. There's going to be a lot of homes lost on the coast because the water's going to rise up and the waves are going to be on top of the water. I'm going to show you the surge maps in a minute. But, you know, there's a time and a place for hype. And those of you that follow me on social media, you know this is one of my pet peeves. Like, it, there's a time for the hype, and then there's a time, like COVID. COVID is a serious deal. This is nothing. COVID-19 is not a joke. It's not a fraud. It's not... For political reasons, as much as you want to believe that, 170,000 people have died. It's probably going to end up being closer to 300,000 by the time everybody gets a vaccine. And, you know, it's a very serious. So the media is not over-exaggerating COVID. Uh, however, in the hurricane situation, sometimes that happens. Case in point, and I'm going to show you a graphic on this as well in a minute, but Hurricane Laura, when it was a tropical storm out there east of the uh, Leeward Islands, um, the hype down here began on the media. It's going to be a hurricane, potentially a major hurricane for Florida because the tropical models, the H. Wharf and the H. Mon, were predicting major hurricane for South Florida. I went on social media and I immediately said, listen, those models are garbage. They're and they don't even have the track right on this. This is not going to be a major hurricane for South Florida. Go back and look it up on Facebook and Twitter. You'll hear me say that. Um, then when it came to 
the threat even from tropical storm conditions in Florida, that became like apparent that that even wasn't going to take place. Meanwhile, you had like WSBN, Channel 7 News down here in South Florida, down in Key West with reporters down in Key West interviewing tourists, scaring the hell out of them, telling them, well, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, and then the person goes, oh, I think it's just going to be some wind and rain, and I'm not really worried about it. I'm here to have a vacation. And, and then and the reporter goes, well, um, you know, it's it, it could be really bad here, you know, with some wind and rain. I mean, uh, are you – did you think about leaving? Did you think about – and and this this goes back and forth, and it happens all the time, when especially when the hurricanes turn like Dorian did and and like Laura did. And they, they scare the hell out of the tourists. They try to make them run. And the tourists were like, no, we know it's just going to be some wind and rain. What do you think is going to happen here? Nothing. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why I didn't get out there. I was going to go down to Key West. And I have these remote cameras. I have a dash cam. I have the weather flow instruments um, uh, on my truck and here at the house. I was going to go down there. Get some squall lines coming through. Measure some winds, 40, 50 miles an hour. Please. I I just, I was going to, I was anticipating going north, though, because early on, some of the models were thinking maybe New Orleans. And, of course, there was Marco out there. And Marco is a whole other thing. I'm going to get to that in a minute, too. But um, I decided Marco's not going to mount anything. And... Laura is going to go too far west, and I, I do not I, – I have a truck with a fortified glass on it and have all my instrumentation and my cameras and everything, and I like to get in these storms and film them. I was in Hurricane Michael, the eye of Hurricane Michael in, uh, in southeast of Panama City. I was just north of Mexico Beach uh, near Tyndall Air Force Base in the eye of Hurricane Michael. In my truck, filming live for you right here on Facebook like you're watching tonight. And the videos were incredible. It was an incredible experience. But I was I had a vehicle that was ready for that. But what I will not do is drive that vehicle all the way to Texas. That's not happening. I'm not going to western Louisiana. It's a heavy flood zone. I'm not willing to lose my vehicle. It's, it's not worth it. So I decided I'm going to stay put for this one. No, uh, what I will do is cover it on Thursday morning. It looks like this is going to be a landfall Thursday morning. Uh, we'll, my my co-host and, and I, uh, Bill Phillips, up in Virginia Beach, will tag team it in the middle of the night. We're going to bring up webcams, chaser videos, radars, satellite imagery, scanner feeds, whatever we can find as this is moving in. Local news, whatever, whatever radio stations, whatever we can find. We will stream it and make an archive about it like we do with every major hurricane that's ever hit the United States um, since 1998. Uh, we've been doing this, and uh, at least I have. Bill joined me in 2003. But we've covered a lot of systems, been in a lot of systems, and that's what we do. But this one is not happening. I'm not driving all the way out there. So back to the hype thing, right? So then it got out into the – it was over western Cuba and strengthening a little bit, and we, we know it's going to become a hurricane at that point. The Weather Channel has been wall-to-wall, as you would expect, right? They've got reporters in the Keys. They've got reporters in New Orleans. They've got reporters in, uh, uh, I, um, uh, what's the name of the city I'm trying to think of? Uh, uh, not Isle of Youth, uh, Isle, um, Grand Isle, Louisiana. And and that's for Marco. And Marco, all the all the indications are, even the NHC forecast pointed this out, Marco was going to briefly become a hurricane and then weaken due to the wind shear in the Gulf of Mexico. Hang a left-hand turn and head towards western Louisiana, which is where it is right now. Much ado about nothing. I think I don't even think New Orleans got tropical storm force winds out of this. They may have gotten a couple of gusts here and there. Maybe a thunderstorm came through. But the whole buildup and the hype, because it's New Orleans. And they're doing the same thing now with Laura, because it's Houston, right? You got Houston to the left, and you got New Orleans to the right. And everybody in the between doesn't seem to matter. 
you got Lake Charles. You've got Intracoastal City. You've got uh, Port Arthur, Texas. You've got Beaumont, Texas. Um, we still have the Boulevard Peninsula, which a, a lot of those homes are rebuilt, but and potentially the Houston Galveston area, but it's not going to hit New Orleans. Look, and I even told my Storm Chase buddies, get out of New Orleans. You're wasting your time there. The storm is coming into Western Louisiana. Get over there and get your stuff set up. But the media is obsessed with New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans. I, I, I put on the Weather Channel as much as I could tolerate it for a little while, and it was just wall-to-wall -wall New Orleans. Um, now they're doing it with, with Houston. Now, the models, and I'm going to get over to them in a minute, the models are starting to ship back right again. This morning they were a little scary for Houston. I think the models are starting to correct now. They're doing this number, right, and they're coming together. And they're coming together over the Texas-Louisiana border. And I think it's pretty, give or take, on just either side of that border, that's where this is coming in. Okay, so can we please stop with the Houston? We saw what happened in uh, Rita in 2005. The hype was through the roof for Houston and that area, and it didn't hit there. People died evacuating from that storm. It was gridlocked. There were people trapped on highways. A bus caught fire. It was just, it was a train wreck. It was a dumpster fire. I would just wish the media would be a little more responsible. Look, I understand there's a hurricane warning out, I believe, or watch. I'm gonna, I, I'll just look at the graphics when they come out at 11 p.m. But uh, that area can be hit. It's possible. But the models are shifting, and I have a feeling... This is going to be like a Rita type of track. And I'm going to show you the Rita track. But I also wanted to mention while we're talking about media, I wanted to, uh, Channel 10 WPLG in Miami really did an outstanding job. They they were covering, and even Brian Norcross said, he said, look, um, this is not going to be a big impact on South Florida. And he also mentioned, which I really appreciated, that the reason we've had this many name storms up to this point is because we've been naming a lot of these mid-latitude or frontal systems up in the northern, coming off the U.S. coast and heading away from the U.S. We've had five systems that were non-tropical in nature. So the notion that we have this blockbuster hurricane season taking place is a little bit even Brian Norcross said, wait a minute, half of these were non-tropical. So we have yet to see what's going to be coming down the pike here. I know we're not far, we're far from being finished here with this hurricane season, but I know we're going to have more big boys coming down the road. But I'm just saying, up to this point, uh, ECAS and Laura and Hannah, um, we're all big players for the United States this year. But up at but beside that, it really hasn't been this blockbuster season yet. Now, this could end up being the, the first major of the season, which I don't think that will be the only major for the United States or the Caribbean. But this is a big deal, yes. But I, I'll, speaking of Channel 10, though, I wanted to say they did a really good job. It was level-headed. They weren't over-the-top hyping. They were keeping it real. And this is the good thing about having a seasoned hurricane forecaster at TV stations. And I think every station should hire somebody, maybe a former director, a former forecaster at the Hurricane Center, to kind of put a real objective on this and let people know, okay, it's time to get scared. It's not time to get scared. Like, they could use somebody right now in Lake Charles, in the Beaumont area, to say to the people, this is going to be really bad. In Houston and New Orleans, they got to just kind of weigh it out and go, listen, we're hoping for the best. We think this is best, but people should not get alarmed. Let's not beat each other over the heads with two-by-fours at Home Depot. There's no point in people getting alarmed. Take it easy. Calm down. Take a deep breath and think it through carefully. If you're in a flood zone, you leave. If you're in a mobile home, you leave. If you feel like your house is vulnerable and you don't have shutters, you might want to leave. If you're in the 
Beaumont, Port Arthur, Lake Charles area, maybe over to Intracoastal City, yes. If you feel like you're vulnerable, get out. But all these other areas, just calm down. And you're probably going to get the back side of this or the front side of it, but you're not getting the core of it. And that's where all the destruction is going to take place. Back to Channel 10, WPLG. I wanted to uh, congratulate Betty Davis for making it back to Channel 10. She has been fighting COVID-19 for like a month, maybe two months. I don't remember how long ago that she got it, but she got it really bad. She was in the hospital. She's back at Channel 10. She's the chief meteorologist at WPLG, so welcome back, Betty. Glad to see you back. Um, just, she even said she's just glad to be alive, that she didn't die. And that COVID is some serious stuff, man. So put your mask on. If you have to evacuate for Hurricane uh, Laura, please bring PPP, PPE with you. Not PPP. The, that's the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. The personal protection, take that with you to the shelter. They may have it at the shelter. Keep your distance. Don't congregate with people. Please be smart people with the COVID. I mean, I'm just so tired of seeing people congregating and not wearing masks. It just doesn't make any sense. We can get through this. Just do the right thing. We can get through this. But with the hurricane, if you have to go to a shelter, bring a mask and hand sanitizer. Keep your hands clean. Stay away from people. It's just for a few days. You can go home and uh, you know, if you have a home to go home to, and if you don't, try to make arrangements with family members out of state. Maybe you can, you know, go somewhere because uh, with this COVID, it's not, it's no, no messing around with this. All right. So uh, let's see some other notes here. Uh, bah, bah, bah. And, and, and as far as the chaser hype, uh, and I'm going to uh, be broadcasting, like I said, Bill and I on early Thursday morning. So there will not be a show here tomorrow night. Now, tomorrow night, you might think, well, we're going to have a good idea tomorrow night where it's going to hit. But I have to go to bed early because Thursday morning, this hurricane's going to be hitting at like 2, 3, 4 in the morning. So I got to get to bed early tomorrow night. There won't be any show tomorrow night. And then Thursday morning, we're going to boot up all the computers and get all the radars and satellites and cam shots. And there are some storm chasers. I talked to Tim Millar here in South Florida, he is over there. Uh, Chris Kalura, Storm Chaser, is over there. The usual sp suspects, Reed Timmer, uh, Josh Morgaman, Mark Sudif. Uh, uh, there might be some others going over there. I'm not sure. And I asked Tim Millar, can you shoot me some live video on Facebook? And he said he's going to try to work on it to try to provide some live video for us. Um and uh, Jeff Petrowski, he's also live down there. He shoots live. I was watching him today. He was in, in Lake Charles, and the connectivity was terrible. And that's another reason why I decided not to go all the way over there for this, because we have these remote cameras. And if they don't connect, we have Verizon and AT&T. If, if they can't connect to those towers, they're useless. And I streamed from the truck with AT&T, which did brilliantly during Hurricane Michael. But... That's a whole different animal. Panama City is a much bigger city compared to Cameron, Louisiana. And so I don't know if the connectivity is going to be that good from this area. So we're going to try to bring you as much as we can as it happens on Thursday morning, but no guarantee of anything. All right, so uh, let me, let's go ahead and get to the images here because I got a lot of stuff to show you tonight. It's currently uh, 822 Eastern Time. Jim Williams here with you. Uh, if you, you haven't seen my shows before, spread the word around this guy. Uh, I run HurricaneCity.com. We have all the graphics and everything. Keep track of every storm uh, in the history since 1871. There's a database with all the graphics and pictures and movies and radars and everything from most hurricanes uh, going way, way back. So, uh, well, radar only came out in the 60s and 70s, but you know, you know what I mean. I mean, all the other stuff that, uh, like old videos and things like from that from old storms. But anyway, let's get to some graphics. Uh, first thing I want to do is show you this, some graphics. So I'm going to screen capture here. All 
Okay, so I hope you can see that. This is the, uh, I'm going to shrink my screen here a little bit. Okay, so I um, got my images queued up here. So first of all, let's go to Rita. And uh, I'm going to have to screen share that separately. Okay, so here is, this was Hurricane Rita from 2005. And I know there's been a lot of comparisons to uh, Laura, Rita and Laura because they're basically pretty much the same intensity and uh, coming in at the same kind of a trajectory. But this was 2 a.m. on September 24th, ironic, almost a month later than where we are right now. And um, this is Hurricane Rita. And notice the wind field on this. Uh, and it, what you have is um, this big, this area right here inside that red circle are hurricane force winds. And those winds at that time extended out 75 miles to the northeast of the center, 60 miles to the southeast of the center, 40 miles to the southwest, well you see inside the red circle it kind of shrinks there, and 60 miles to the northwest. So keep that visual in mind. That's Hurricane Rita. This Hurricane Rita was twice the size of what Laura is expected to be when it gets to the coast. So let's go to Laura. And here is what Laura is expected to be. Now this is based on the 5 p.m. advisory from the National Hurricane Center. And at that time, Laura is supposed to have 35 miles to the northeast. 30 miles to the southeast, 30 miles to the southwest, and 30 miles to the northwest. Basically 30, 30, 30, 30, all the way around. That's half the size of Hurricane Rita. That's what the National Hurricane Center is projecting that Laura is going to look like when it gets near the coast. Now, it could be a little bigger than this, but what I'm saying is, and if you look at the yellow circle out in here, that's including Galveston, which would be tropical storm conditions, all the way over here to Morgan City, right at the edge of Morgan City. These are all tropical storm. And then the aqua circle are sustained tropical storm force winds. And then the red circle are hurricane force winds. So again, if you, you compare that to, uh, there's Rita again, and at Rita... Again, here, here, let's go back out and look at the, uh, here we are almost all the way to New Orleans, tropical storm force, and way south of Galveston, way down here to Port O'Connor, Texas. That's how far the tropical storm force winds extended in Hurricane Rita. So Rita, twice the size as what Laura is expected to be, when it gets to the coast. And we'll compare this at 11 p.m. when that advisory comes out. But I just wanted to clarify that because all the hype and the comparing this to Rita, while granted, it's the same intensity, 120 miles an hour, in Hurricane Laura, that wind is going to be more concentrated. And there it is again. There's Laura. All that wind is going to be more concentrated right in this area right in here a very small area of hurricane force winds compared to what we were seeing with rita so that's that's a huge difference all right so what i also wanted to show you was uh take a look at this 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 track this is the entire track of her of laura so far and if you look at this you can see, notice early on out here, it was moving west-northwest, and then the center kind of reorganized further to the south down in here. 
and then continued on the same, you know, it's about 270, 275 degrees, right? All the way through the greater Antilles. But from a Florida perspective, had this continued on like this, this could have been a major hurricane for South Florida. And the tropical models were predicting that, but where the tropical models were wrong, the H wharf and the H mon, is they were they were wrong on track. The other models, such as the European and the GFS, to a to a lesser extent, GFS did have a couple runs coming into Florida, but the European and especially the UK Met nailed that track over the Greater Antilles down in here, and. That's where all the media hype up in here was happening because they thought this track was going to take place uh, based on the H wharf. And, and there were a few runs from the National Hurricane Center where they did have it coming into Florida uh, as a hurricane. But as things go, as time goes by, you know, the, the models get a little better with each day. And when the hurricane hunters get out there and all that data goes into the models, they improve. And that reorganization, though, down here, really save Florida. Uh, Florida is very lucky when it comes to a lot of these systems because there's usually a, a poof situation that goes on around Hispaniola or a reorganization either north or south that saves Florida. But again, kind of interesting to consider that track was up in here and that one little reorganization just east of the Leeward Islands saved Florida from a potential major hurricane strike. So this is um, Holly Beach. This was from Hurricane Rita in 2005. Look at all these homes out in here. Most of them probably on stilts. You know, they were elevated to deal with storm surge. And there's the before and after. What I did is I scoured the internet at the time back in 2005, and I took the uh, before and after shots and spliced them together and made one image out of it. But tremendous amount of damage. And this is the kind of damage that you could expect with Hurricane Laura if it comes in as 120 mile an hour. Now, again, the, the thinking is, though, and this is, and I'm going to get to the surge maps from the Hurricane Center in just a minute. But the thinking is on this, the surge might not be as high as with Rita because Rita was such a large system, again, twice the size as far as the hurricane force wind field is concerned. And so that wall of water and that dome of water that comes in on the coast is twice the size. So will this kind of damage take place? Yes, but it will probably be in a much smaller area than what Rita did. Uh, Maybe not much smaller, but somewhat smaller than what Rita did. And of course, a lot of it depends on how intense this gets, too. If it stays at 110, 115, 120, it'll be similar to what Rita did. Maybe a little bit less in, in the magnitude and the scope of it. But if it ramps up to 140, 150 miles an hour, it's going to be this kind of damage. So that's just wanted to show you this before and after from uh, Rita. And finally, here is a radar from Rita back in 2005. And, um, oops, uh, let me go back. Uh, it's not letting me zoom in on this. It's a, it's a GIF image. Anyway, this was a radar shot, a snapshot of the radar I took in Rita from 2005. And what I wanted to point out to you, you know, Bill and I have talked about this on numerous shows, and that is the bat look. And what happens is dry air gets in behind the system, and uh, uh, i got to change my colors here. Uh, let me see. Uh, what, uh, draws, uh, what am I doing here? Well, I uh, can't. Well, anyway, let's just do this. Let's pretend that the dry air is on the outside of this image, right? And here it comes, and the dry air circulates into the center of the hurricane, and there it is. And that happened in Hurricane Rita in 2005.
the dry air circulated in from the south as the trough was approaching from the west and it had the bat look and notice it looks like a bat up in here and it happens it's happened with it happened with Katrina it happened with Rita it's happened with uh, I don't know if it happened with Ike but I, I think it's happened with a few others that have been up in the northern Gulf it did not happen with Hurricane Michael though and the reason it didn't happen with Michael is because Michael was turning away from the it was being actually guided by a trough but it was the dry air was not behind Michael it was out in front of it so it was kind of Michael was unaffected by this dry air coming in from the south it's very rare that a system gets in the northern Gulf and does not get impacted by dry air Michael was one of those but this was Rita and I fully expect that this could happen this time as well where we almost are dealing with a half a storm in other words two o'clock in the morning the eye walk come, the northern eye walk comes in on the coast and then two hours later the backside comes in and it's all dry maybe dr sprinkly rainy drizzly very high winds from the south but not that heavy dense CDO type southern eye wall you're just not going to get that if that dry air gets a hold of Laura as it comes in on the coast but this was Rita and again look for the bat look and I'll point it out to you on Thursday morning when I do the hurricane warning show I'm going to point out the bat look on the radar and I'm sure we'll see it all right so uh, oh, one more image I wanted to show you okay this was the model these were the models on Rita and it's always fun to compare storms because you can't have almost a, a more textbook the only thing that comes to mind that between Rita and Laura is maybe Hurricane Francis and Hurricane Jean that hit Florida they were almost identical twin hurricanes and this was these were the models on Rita and I, I, I again I took a snapshot of the models from 2005 and the best performing models at that time were the GFS in blue right out in here took it right over the border and the UK met in black right there so they both nailed that track and guess who the two best performers are so far on Laura you guessed it the UK met and the GFS the euro isn't doing that great on this storm believe it or not I mean it's doing good but not as good as the GFS and the UK met and I'll show you those graphics in a minute too but uh, just to clear the drawings uh, the the terrible models were the Canadian way out here in central Texas the no gaps the GFDL which is now the H wharf we're all the way over in Galveston so again you know it's it's one of those things where you got you know what at the end of the day when it comes down to it, it, it go, it's between the GFS the euro and the UK met those are always the three best models global models I'm talking about on these systems um, for whatever reason it always comes down to those three and the UK met has been performing brilliantly on Laura and I'm going to show you the graphics on that okay so let me go ahead and show you um, let me see we, we took on the models uh, let me show you a couple of changes that have taken place on the front page of Hurricane City and some really interesting data that you can get a hold of on the front page of Hurricane City so let me go ahead and screen capture that okay so here is the front page of Hurricane City and by the way for those of you that are wondering um, for like the beginning of the hurricane season and, and half of uh, last hurricane season the database was the front page of Hurricane City you're probably wondering what happened to Hurricane City well we were having issues with the when I say we Chris Hollis and I we've been working crazy on this problem uh, with Hurricane City and what happened was the GIS maps I built those GIS maps and put the put the layers on there and everything and so what happened was there was a layer I put population totals 
in a lot of the locations in the Caribbean, which is really cool because you want to zoom in and see how many people live in all those neighborhoods. And I put those population totals in there. And for some reason, the iPhones didn't like it and the iPad. Um, any smartphone that had an Apple operating system was rejecting that data for some reason, and it was crashing the browser. So if you were to pull I, uh, Hurricane City up on an iPhone, it would just keep refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. Now it is fixed. So we eliminated the, some of the population data on there, and it now loads at, uh, on an Apple, on an Android. Whatever, whatever device you're using, you can pull up Hurricane City. So anyway, Chris did a fantastic job. He went and troubleshooted every single scenario with the GIS map. Let's eliminate this. Let's eliminate this. Let's eliminate this. And finally, we figured out what the problem was. And so Chris, Chris Hollis is tremendous. Uh, he's been helping for years with Hurricane City. And, you know, he, he adds all the graphics and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you know, are in these maps and like the Hurricane Hunter program. So let me pull that up real quick and show you the, the latest uh, recon. That's found at the yellow links at the bottom of the uh, tracking map there. So the, um, the NOAA 9 is out there, by the way. That's the smaller aircraft that samples the upper air environment north of the system to kind of figure out. It helps the, the data goes into the models, and it makes the models better. But I'm not going to show you that. What I am going to show you is the NOAA Hurricane Hunter that's currently flying the system right now. So the map zooms in. And you can, um, you know, pan in and zoom out. And there it's flying its alpha pattern there. It uh, looks like a butterfly. And so here we go, uh, 984 millibars. So when you click on that, you can get all this really interesting data from the Hurricane Hunters. And uh, you can see here, there's several things I like to look for, and that's the SFMR winds and the size of the eye and the temperature of the eye because that kind of tells you whether the system is really taken off or not. And so we have, uh, uh, nope, they don't have any characterization on the eye, unfortunately. Uh, the SFMR surface winds outbound 64.4 miles an hour, so that's right at hurricane strength. Um, and that was northwest of the eye wall. Uh, assuming there's an eye, which they don't talk about. Um, the SFMR outbound winds are 82 miles an hour. And that was in the southeast quadrant of the hurricane. They measured the, the winds of 82.9 miles an hour. Um, let's see. The differential between the inside and outside eye, eye temperatures is... Uh, four degrees Celsius difference. So generally, there is a difference between the inner and the outer eye wall temperatures, but the greater the distance from uh, Derek Ort, who we used to have on the shows years ago, described that the larger the difference between the inner and the outer eye wall temperatures would indicate the, the greater chance of the greater organization is strengthening that's happening with the system. It's deepening. Uh, right now, it's about four degree difference. So it's it's strengthening, but it's not rapidly intensifying or anything like that. You would see like a six or seven mile an hour difference in the inner and outer eye wall temperatures if this was really rapidly taking off right now. And what I like to do also when I look at the Hurricane Hunter program, I like to go out from the center and kind of because remember the graphic I just showed you, winds 35, hurricane force winds 35 miles out from the center. So if you come out here and you click on these barbs out here, and you can kind of see what the winds are. Uh, we're talking 40 knots, 40, 46 mile an hour surface winds uh, that far away from the center, which is not real far from the center. So uh, and those are the strongest winds, by the way. When you get into the purples, we're talking, uh, well, here we go, 54 mile an hour uh, southeast of the center. Up here northwest of the center, we have 42 mile an hour winds, and southwest of the center, we have 33 mile an hour winds. So the strongest winds are to the southeast of the center at the moment, or at least that's when this when this was taken. And by the way, the timestamp on this is 23:16. That's 
That's uh, well, 13, 14, 15, 16, it's 740. That's like an hour or so old, like an hour and a half ago that that drop zone. Now, they'll put another drop zone down before they leave. Wait a minute. Maybe they're leaving already. Yeah, they are. They're already heading back. See, it, they, it shows them the plane heading out. Actually, that could have been the plane heading in. Let me see. No, they're still in there. They're still flying in there. See, the, they're right there. You can see the airplane. Uh, the kind of a drawing of an airplane right there. So they're still in there, and they'll drop another drop zone in here before they leave. But another thing that Chris added was the zoomable track, the zoomable satellite. We used to use the NOAA uh, satellites, and for whatever reason, they've decided to lock. They do not allow you to embed the NASA satellite anymore. So Chris pulled this, pulled the, found this satellite, and the beautiful thing about this is you can zoom right in on it. So you can zoom in, and it takes a few frames to load because it's got to put all the images together. And it'll animate it. And see, here we go. You can see the system. Uh, you know, again, the deeper purples, the magenta colors down in here would indicate some pulsing, maybe some strengthening, rising high cloud tops going further up into the atmosphere. And uh, But there's no eye present. You notice there's no eye present in the satellite at all. So it's still trying to get its act together. Uh, it's not rapidly intensifying. But now here's a neat thing about the satellite. You can choose. Let's choose uh, the. You can choose from visible, water vapor, infrared, or color enhanced infrared. So let's go with the vapor loop, and uh, it'll reload under the vapor loop. And you see that dry air just to the west of it, that yellow air. That is sinking air, and there's a little channel. That can come in. That comes in on this, and so here it is. Uh, if if it starts to work its way in to this gap right in here, and especially if it gets near the coastline and it does this, you're going to see the bat look. It, the bat look won't happen now because there's a lot of moisture available out there around the the system itself, but. As it approaches the coast, there might be more dry air that gets sucked into the storm, which might erode the southern portion of the hurricane um, on, to, on Thursday morning. We'll have to see about that. But this is a really cool image to uh, pull up with the with those zoomed-in satellites. So really cool stuff. Again, thank you, Chris, uh, for, for um, adding this feature. Really neat. One more thing I want to show you are the sea surface temperatures. And uh, this is another GIS map that, that I put together that has the cone on top of it. So you can kind of get an idea of where it's going to go based on the National Hurricane Center uh, forecast. And if we get zoomed right in on that, uh, you can see here and you use a little color code at the top here of the of the tracking map and you can see that we have temperatures around 87 88 degrees out in front of the path of hurricane laura so it's got plenty of really warm piping warm waters and basically everything going for it the only thing that i'm a little concerned about with the structure of it is that you're going to get a little bit of that dry air that i just showed you on the vapor loop that could get sucked in from the west and, and kind of disrupt it a little bit so speaking of which, uh, this is the uh, University of Wisconsin uh, upper level. This is the uh, upper level wind shear maps. And I know this is kind of, for those of you that are new to seeing this image, it's kind of chaotic. And you know, what, what am I looking at here? Anything that's in red is unfavorable wind shear. So you can see that Laura is right on the edge of the red in the northwest Gulf of Mexico, the wind shear out of the southwest. And then you have the wind shear to the southeast. So Laura is kind of caught in a little bubble, and that's that high pressure ridge. So let me show you something. Well, let me use a different color. Let's go with blue. And all right, so we have this. Well, let me go thicker with it. All right, so we have the winds out of the southwest up in here. 
and we have the winds out of the north down around Cuba. So basically, that's almost ventilation for the hurricane. You have the wind being evacuated. This is what I call ventilation. The wind being evacuated from the north side of the hurricane, and then the wind being evacuated from the south side of the hurricane down here. And there's your high pressure ridge directly over. It's almost like a bubble over the top of the hurricane. So technically speaking, this thing is in a perfectly favorable environment right now for strengthening because it's ventilated. It's got everything going for it. And that was not always the case when it was over the Caribbean, uh, the Greater Antilles. The high pressure ridge was just to the southeast of it. Uh, there was a little bit of shearing and dry air out in front of it. But right now it's got everything going for it except for that little bit of dry air out in front of it. So we're going to see if that has an effect on it. All right, so let's talk about the models. And... Here is the, oh, that's not the one I wanted to show. I wanted to show the, what happened to it? Um, oh, there it is. Okay, so here is the, this is the UK Met model. And this is from uh, the FSU site. And what they do is they show the potential intensity of, the hurricanes in the Atlantic, and they're showing this right around 960, 950-ish, like 955, based on the color code over here to the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and they show it coming right in on the Texas-Louisiana border. And again, this is the UK Met. This has been the best performer at least at four days out. It's been off by about 70 miles in four days. Compared to the other models, not even close. <laughs> Excuse me. <sighs> anyway, um, so the UK Met is the best performer on track, and not only is it the best performer on track, it's the best performer on intensity. Going out, um, Four days, it's going. It's only averaging off about three miles an hour on an average of uh, on a five-day period. So it's been doing really good on intensity and track. The best of all the models is the UK Met, and the UK Met. If you if you were paying attention to models, and I know there's a lot of hurricane fanatics out there to pay attention to this stuff, and if you were paying attention to that UK Met model when this was east of the Caribbean and entering the Caribbean. That model predicted it was going to go south of Cuba the whole time. And the other models, like the, well, the European was predicting it was going to dissipate. But the GFS was leaning on the north side of the, of the islands, and so was the Canadian and the NAVGEM. So this model really had the best handle on it early on, taking it south of Cuba and going up in the northwest Gulf. So th this is the model I'm really banking on. I'm at Texas-Louisiana border. 950, 955 millibars. I think that is a good handle on it, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. So the best, the second best performing model, and by the way, if you want to find out this data, and I'm not just blowing smoke out my ass here. I mean, this is actual. What we do is uh, we have a program at Hurricane City that gathers the best track data from the National Hurricane Center. It gets all the models, like 150 of them gathers all the data, and it calculates day by day by day what the error rate is of the models. And what's really cool about our system is we can color code it. You can, you can choose what's called a heat map, and it will allow you to choose. You know what? Let me just show you because some people might be wondering, wait a minute, where can I find this? So let, let, me, uh, let me do that for you. All right, here we are back at the front page of Hurricane City, right? Go right down here where it says Laura Best Track Data, where I moused over to turn black here. So you click on that, and there's the Hurricane Laura Best Track Data. Choose this box right here. It's right, right in here, right below where it says uh, Google Maps and Google Earth. Click on where it says Table. Don't click the graphs because there's so many graphs, so many models on the graph, you can't tell one from the other. I like to use the table. So I click on table, 
and it pulls up all the models on a table. Now what I like to do is choose heat map over here. So we see where it says heat map to the left. You choose average error, and that'll give you the average error over five days, and then click display up here. And it'll refresh again, and what that does is it color codes everything. And it goes through all the models. Look at them all. There's hundreds in here. And they're all color coded. So green is good and red is bad. And in between, naturally, if it's pink or whatever, it's, it's, it's okay. White is average. Um, but what you like to look for is what happens over time. So the, the column on the left is when this first event was way back in the Eastern Caribbean Sea. And the column all the way to the right is where we're at right now, when it was entering the, the Gulf of Mexico. So if you look at, like, for example, look at the AP01 over here. Uh, like this AP01 right here. If you take that model and look over time, it's getting better. See, it was red in the beginning, performing poorly. Then it got, you know, average in here and now it's it's dark green because it's improving over time it's getting better as time goes on on that model so naturally um, you scroll down and you know and I go through each model and you know pick out who's done the best who's done the worst blah blah and then you go down further down here and it goes to intensity It'll give you who's performing the best on intensity. Again, red, the worst. Green, the best on intensity. The least amount of errors is the green. So whoever's got in the green is doing the best. And, you know, you notice uh, the, uh, by the way, the GFS is the AVNO. It used to be called the aviation model. So they still use AVNO for, for the GFS signifier. So if you're looking for the GFS, it's the AVNO operational model of the GFS, but uh, notice the, the AVNO, it, it got really good about three, two, three days ago, and now recently it's kind of getting a little bit, you know, and you know why that is? Because the GFS was predicting it was going to be on the north coast of Cuba and it ended up being on the south coast. So that was the difference, and that's why it kind of got worse as the days went by. And then you can do that with all, and again, look at the uh, Let's take a look at the H wharf and the ECMW, uh, the uh, HMON rather. So here they are together. And this is why I always say those tropical models are terrible. Look at this. Uh, there they are. This is, this is the intensity, right? They're getting worse over time. They were okay in the beginning, but then look, as time went by, they got red, and they're, they're terrible. Like, they're just, they're not very good models, especially on intensity. And the reason they're not good on intensity is because they don't get the track right a lot of the time, and that also factors into the intensity. So one hand goes with the other, and that's why the Euro, the GFS, and the UK Met are doing well on intensity because they have the track right, too. Okay, so that's just something for you to play with. I'm going to get out of here because I don't want to confuse some people that are, you know, that don't want to be bothered with this. And this is just a bunch of over the top, you know, too much TMI. Okay, so uh, let me clear all that and then get out of here and go back to the Euro. Okay, so here we are at Levi's site, uh, Tropical Tidbits. And uh, this is the, I'm going to, Lay, display all the all the models to you um, based on who's performing the best. The Euro is one of the best. It's one of the top three, as usual. It's usually the best, but in this case, the Euro is about third place on Laura. It's usually the best. It's not doing that as good this time, but, you know, at the end of the day, and every every expert will tell you this, when it, all com when it comes to the finish line, you know, the GFS is going to nail it. It might have its fluctuations. It's going to go back and forth, back and forth. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the Euro will pick <laughs> the best landfall off point. <coughs> Another tickle in the throat. Sorry about that. All right, so let's go back. Um, and so there's the Euro. It has it at 969, just west of the Louisiana-Texas border. This is the latest run of the Euro. 
uh, at uh, 900 and uh, 969. So it's gone up a little bit. The euro, the euro had it a little bit deeper. Uh, the, the euro had it a little deeper on the last run, and now it's kind of a little weaker. So we'll see if that's a trend with the models. But uh, the euro, just to let you know, yesterday morning, the euro had it coming in to uh, the Texas-Louisiana border at 974 millibars. So it's pretty consistent from yesterday to today. The European is showing basically Category 3-ish type pressure right at the Texas-Louisiana border. And as far as, uh, it's number three on track, and it's it's not doing very well on intensity. I gotta say, the European model has not been doing well on intensity at all. It's off by over 30, 30 miles and 30 knots at uh, five days. So it's kind of struggled with this. And the reason for that is, again, if you go back and look at the Euro runs, they had it dissipating over the Greater Antilles, so, uh, you know, that's why the euro had it, it was a very weak system for a long time until it finally got on board as an organized tropical system. So it's taken a while to catch up. Not to say that the euro is bad on intensity on Laura. It's just that it's it, now that it's got its act together, I think it'll get better as it closes in on the coast. But it's predicting category three, just in a nutshell. All right. So who was the number two? best performer that is the gfs on laura the number two best performer is the gfs so let's take a look at the gfs and uh run that and we'll run the western atlantic um and i like to go with the uh 850 millibar sea level pressure so let's go um uh, here we go oops um uh, let's go frame by frame on this by the way all right, so there's the latest GFS, 964 millibars right on the coast of, just right on the coast. I mean, you couldn't split it any better between Texas and Louisiana. Uh, again, similar to the Euro, 964 millibars. Uh, that's like Category 3-ish kind of pressure. Um, and just to let you know, <clears throat> yesterday morning, the GFS had it coming in just a little bit east of here. Where it's showing right now, it had it coming into Cameron at 955 millibars, so it's about 10 millibars weaker and a little bit to the left of where it was yesterday. That's the GFS. And uh, <clears throat> the GFS has been off by 133 miles in five days, which is pretty good. And it's been off on intensity. It's number four on intensity at 17.5 knots over five days. So not real good on intensity. Again, because it was missing the track, it had it off the north coast of Cuba. It went to the south coast of Cuba. Again, that's why the Euro is, the, I mean, the UK Met is the best. <clears throat> but the um, GFS has had problems with intensity because of the track that it ended up taking. But it's it's been pretty good on track, the second best on track besides the UK Met. And it takes it right at the Texas-Louisiana border. Okay, number three is the Euro. I just showed you that. Number four, believe it or not, on track has been the H wharf. So let's run the H wharf on on Laura, and uh, it now has it uh, coming in just east of the Texas Louisiana border at 947 millibars, which is, you know, a strong category three. It could get the cat four perhaps. Um, but looks like strong category three, right into Cameron, 947 millibars. It's been off by about 202 miles in five days. So, uh, you know, it could, it could be over here and by the time it makes landfall, it could be over here in intercoastal city, or it could be all the way over to Galveston, uh, based on the error rate, but it's, it's been the number four best performer. And then on intensity, the H wharf is terrible. The H wharf is this, the worst on intensity. It's number seven on intensity. Just terrible. Uh, so the, again, these models, the H wharf and the H mon have been over aggressive on this system the entire time. So I think the GFS Euro solution is a little more realistic with the 955, 960, 965 range rather than 947. But anyway, that's that's the uh, H wharf. So number five on track is the Canadian model. 
And uh, here's the Canadian right at the coast uh, coming in at 979. Now, notice that how far west this comes in, though. It has it coming in at 979 millibars right into Galveston. But it shows kind of a lopsided system where everything is on the right-hand side of this, and it shows like a dry air slot coming in there, which uh, is a realistic possibility. So even if it were to hit Galveston straight on, the worst weather would be on the right side, the Boulevard Peninsula, north side of Houston, you know, up towards Beaumont and areas like that, over toward western Louisiana, even with this kind of a track. But this is the Canadian. It's the fifth best performer. And uh, again, it has it coming in like Category 2, Category 1-ish kind of pressure. So not real aggressive there on the Canadian. And, and the Canadian has been number two on intensity. So the Canadian model is doing doing pretty well on, on intensity. So there's something to be said there. So we'll see if the Canadian ends up being right on intensity. Uh, I don't know if I buy that track necessarily, but I could see that kind of an intensity, although I think it's going to be a little stronger than this. And then <clears throat> number six is the H-Mon model. And uh, let's go with the uh, H-Mon on Laura. And so here we go. The H-Mon has it 953 millibars right into Cameron, Louisiana, smack dab and going up into St. Charles. Uh, uh, so 953, that's probably strong cat three type pressure. Um Coming in from the south, no dry slot on the south side of this. The HMON's predicting it's going to be a little bit better organized when it comes in. But on intensity, the HMON is fifth. So it's not really, again, tropical model, not doing well on intensity. It's been over-aggressive the whole time. I think this might be overdoing it a little bit. I think the 160 to 160, uh, 165, 960 to 965 millibars is probably more realistic. But we'll see. I mean... Tomorrow night, we're going to know. At this time tomorrow night, I won't be live because I'll be preparing for the hurricane warning show in the early morning hours, but you'll see that this could be, a, you know, border cat four. I mean, anything's possible. I know Rob over at Crown Weather thinks that. Um, it's possible. I don't really think it, you know, I, I don't know. I. It's a hard one to call. It's got everything going for it. But that dry air and that little slot to the west is kind of concerning. And the fact that it's not really rapidly organizing right now is a little concerning as well for reaching this kind of intensity. And, of course, the worst performer, as always, is the NAVGEM, the Navy model. So uh, let's go to the Navy and uh, pull that model up and... Uh, so here we go. The nav gem, you notice how my voice just went down when I talk about the nav gem. It just, I, my eyes glaze over when the nav gem model comes. I don't know what it is. I just, I, all right. So the nav gem takes it right over just east of Galveston, Houston area, maybe just a tad, maybe 10, 20 miles to the east, uh, west of the Texas, Louisiana border going into Beaumont, Port Arthur. Uh, 988, let's see, what does it come in at? 987. So it has a cat, cat like the strength, the, the pressure that it is now. But let's see what it has it out in the Gulf here. Yeah, see, it has it at 1,000 millibars. This is why I don't, I don't like the Navy model. Like, look, it, it has it where it's at right now, it's got 1,000 millibars. It's already much deeper than that. So this model is, is garbage. It's just, it's too weak. For where it is right now, it's like 980, I think we're at 982 millibars out there right now. Um, you know, I just read the pressure. I don't know why I can't remember that. Um, but anyway, so if it's if it's already off by 20 millibars, so you got to figure 988, 968 would be the extrapolating it downwards would be more realistic. So probably... Cat 2, Cat 3 strength, perhaps. I don't know. The Navy is just a terrible model. And in intensity, the Navy is... Uh, you know what? I didn't even write that down. 
It, I think it's so bad, it's, it's embarrassing. Uh, I didn't write it down. Um, and then, of course, there's the icon model. And I know a lot of people have questions about the icon model. It's, it's a German model. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it. I'm not an expert on these models. I just, I'm, I just keep track of the numbers on the models. But the, uh, the, the icon, let's, let's go ahead and run it. Um, and by the way, uh, the GFS para has been absolutely abysmal. But so here is the icon model. And uh, it hasn't pretty much the, the intensity that it is right now out there that the recon is finding, like 980. Now well, it's a little little weaker than what the recon is currently finding. So this model takes it just, you know, like splitting the difference between Houston and Beaumont, like somewhere in between there. Um, again, the right, the winds on the right side would be the worst. Um, it's showing at 962, let me see, no, nine, so it's hard to read this, 963 millibars. So again, pretty much in line with what the other models are thinking in a nutshell, 960 to nine, it's basically a 955 to 965 millibar game at this point with most of the models, but the icon has been, um, uh, the icon is number three in intensity, so it hasn't really been that bad on intensity. Unfortunately, our system does not track the icon on track, so I can't grade the icon, but or or the para model, because uh, we haven't added that into the system, and or maybe the data isn't available. I don't know. I have to get with Chris on that, but the icon track track record is not on the system it's just the intensity and it's been off it's it's number three on intensity so doing pretty well the icon on intensity and again that takes it in there at 962 uh just east of houston now the para model which is the parallel model to the gfs it's the new gfs that's out i think it's the vf3 or something it's it's done terrible it was predicting that um let me let me get back on camera here it was predicting that uh, the that Hurricane Laura, that Marco rather, <clears throat> excuse me, Marco, was going to become an intense hurricane and go up into the where Laura is headed. That was what the GFS Para was predicting, and I noticed that after that happened, they stopped running that model. Period. Like it's not, or at least on Tropical Atlantic, uh, Tropical Atlantic. On that's Chris's site on Tropical Tidbits. They stopped running that model because it's so bad. So they got big problems with that model. The GFS, if, if they're comparing it with the GFS, the GFS is hands down winning. I mean, the, the para has done terribly. So um, UK met number one. GFS number two, Euro number three. If you combine those three models, having uh, many years as I've been doing this, it always comes down to those three. They're going to do this right on the on the runs and at the end of the at the end of the run they're going to come together like this and you're going to have your landfall point so jeff uh, euro texas louisiana border gfs texas just east of the border and the uk met is right on the border so we'll see i mean tomorrow night thursday morning we're going to know it's coming right on the border now Here's the question. When it comes on shore, what's going to happen? So let's look at the National Hurricane Center and go to the surge maps here real quick. Okay, so here is the current track from the National Hurricane Center on Laura. And it has it uh, coming in, you know, 1 a.m. on Thursday, major hurricane, right on the border, Texas, Louisiana. I think they got the track nailed. But let's take a look at the uh, surge inundation. Let's 
And I think I'm going to have to screen. Well, maybe it'll capture this. Yeah, it will. Okay. All right. So here, here's the deal. And here's our legend down below. And you can see that uh, greater than nine feet above ground will be underwater. That's all this red area. So obviously we're going to have a large storm surge. If you look at all that red, that's all going under. And this is one of the reasons I did not head over here for this. Because the only as a storm chaser, the only way you're going to get a view that's safe of this thing is getting way into Lake Charles, way inland, find high ground. If you can find ground that's, you know, 10 feet above the ground, you'll be lucky. And just get inland as far as you can because this is all going underwater. Um, I mean, this is Lake Charles, like at the top of the lake here, and it's all red. That is water... Um, uh, people that are nine feet above ground are going to be underwater. Um, and even even way up in here, further inland, you know, I don't know if there's a scale of miles. Let's see, 30, yeah, 30 miles inland here. We're talking areas where there could be a foot of water. So you have to get all the way up 30 miles inland to get away from the surge. That's how bad this is going to be if this pans out, if this track pans out and this intensity pans out. So, bad situation, man. I mean, but notice over here, based on the current track, notice over towards Houston, Texas, I mean, uh, Houston, Galveston area, we're talking, you know, a foot of water, a foot above ground, might flood a little bit. Um, but if you're a higher than a foot or two above ground, you're probably going to be okay in the Houston area. Now, rainfall, that's a whole other situation. So, let's get to the rainfall on this. And uh, again, you know, I'm doing this now so that when the advisory comes out, about 45 minutes, we can compare notes on this. But notice the uh, 10 inches of rain coming into the Lake Charles area, the Cameron, Louisiana, and then uh, lesser amounts, you know, uh, between 6 and 10 inches, uh, all from Intracoastal City, Louisiana, all the way through Beaumont, Port Arthur. Uh, again, 10 plus inches right at the coast. And then you have four, four, in, four to six inches. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, over towards uh, uh, Intracoastal City, Louisiana, and just just east of Houston. Houston, you can expect anywhere from two to four inches, and an inch on the uh, southeastern areas of of Houston, Galveston area. And notice how far inland this rain swath is. I mean. Arkansas, you're going to get nailed, heavy rains, and then it's going to turn northeast and head toward the eastern seaboard. And then some of the models predict it's going to re-strengthen off the coast, uh, become an extra tropical type system and head just south of the Canadian Maritimes. But uh, anyway, so I just want to show you one more thing here, and this is the wind history on this from the National Hurricane Center. And just to let you know, some of my top 20 uh, to be impacted this year were Oviedo, Dominican Republic, southern tip of Dominican Republic was brushed by Laura as a tropical storm. Manzanillo, Cuba, which is eastern Cuba, was also impacted directly by tropical storm Laura. And Cabo Corrientes, the very west tip, southwest of Havana, tropical storm as well. And the Cayman Islands got on there. That was my number three this year. The Cayman Islands, just the very northern Cayman Islands, Cayman Brac, Little Cayman, got nicked by 40 mile an hour winds. So that gets included in my top 20. So far, four out of my top five have been impacted this young season. We're only, uh, we're not even halfway through. And well, yeah, we are halfway. Let's see, June, July, yeah, August 15th would be halfway. Uh, yeah. So. We're a little over halfway through, and I've almost got most of my top 20 impacted already. Okay, is there anything else I wanted to show? No, that's it. So let me do this. Uh, I wanted to show you 
Uh, let me get back on camera here. I wanted to show you Google Earth of the areas that are going to be impacted here on Thursday morning because I was doing it the other day, looking at, you know, for, for chase potential, and it is grass, sticks, very few trees, believe it or not. Barrick open, great for measuring wind. If you could get wind instruments right on that coast, baby, there's nothing to obstruct those instruments. Uh, houses and buildings are far and few between. When, you, when you're talking south of Lake Charles, heading toward the ocean, toward, toward the Gulf, very... So let me show you this. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I'm pulling up the Google Earth, and then we're going to screen capture. And I'm going to zoom in on Lake Charles, and I'm going to show you how f flood prone this area is and how sparsely populated it is. And we'll go ahead and uh, zoom, uh, screen capture this. Huh? Wait a minute. Okay. All right, we're zooming in on Lake Charles. Let me see if I can capture this. Huh. Interesting. It is not letting me screen share that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's pan this out. This is Lake Charles. And that's the area that we were talking about. So I'm going to try to get you in on the coast here because this is kind of a neat view, kind of like an if you were an airplane flying in on this. So. So these are the two areas that I'm really concerned about here going into. I believe this is Beaumont over here. And notice on the coast, there's like nothing. It's all just, you know, grass and bushes and telephone poles. And there's really no infrastructure on the immediate coast here and where this eye wall is supposed to come in. And again, when you, you get down to street level, and I'll show you that in a minute too. But I mean, it is like, let's just take the inlet here. Uh, this is uh, Sabine Pass, you know, going into, uh, you know, the, the splitting of between Louisiana and Texas border here. And, you know, when you get down to street level, it is, there's like nothing down here. It is just, uh, there's a few buildings here and there, but I mean, you get down to ground level, this is it. Um, houses on stilts. And this is what Jeff Petrowski was showing earlier today. And, you know, and I mean, there we go. It's just nothing but houses like this on stilts, you know, but look at how flat there's no trees. Like there's nothing to beat that wind down. Like these houses are going to get annihilated by the surge and the wind. But there's really nothing. If you were a storm chaser and you were going down this road, this road, that water is going to be, the water will be literally probably up to here. Like, that's how high this water is going to be up in here. It's going to be really high above those houses. Like, that water is, is going to be tremendously high. This whole world will be completely underwater. And then uh, I'm going to exit the street view because... Uh,
you get over to um, the water areas, and there's a bridge. Where was it? There's a bridge that comes across when you get down to the coast. Uh, where is it? There was a bridge up in here. I don't know what that is. Let me see if that's a boat. Of course, these are old images. These are from like a year ago. But, nah, it's not giving me the street view. Looks like a large vessel, like a container ship of some sort. Um, but, I mean, you compare that to a metropolitan area like you know, Fort Lauderdale or Miami or New Orleans or Houston. I mean, this is bare bones, you know, nothing out here. Let's take a look over here. This looks like a refinery of some sort. Uh, you know, so all over there, yeah, there's like a power plant, refinery. Uh, but again, it's all sticks and woods, not, not even woods, just bushes. And there's just nothing out here. It's just bare, desolate land. Uh, wooden telephone poles. So, again, there's our landfall point. There's Lake Charles right here, and... Beaumont over here. Those are going to be the bullseyes. And when you get it, you get them more into the city, like you, let's fly into like Lake Charles, and you know it becomes more densely populated. There's a little bit of a town here, and this is where these people. I don't think they all have to evacuate Lake Charles, but I think a lot of this area is going to go underwater, and so there's got to be some areas here where it might be a little elevated. I would think. Uh, so let's go down to street level and see what we got down here. Uh, you know, so let's see what kind of houses we have here. I mean, regular looks like CBS. Nope, nothing's on stilts. They're all ground level houses. Uh, look like decent construction. Uh, you know, trees and whatnot to buffet the wind a little bit. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at is, uh, like it's your typical residential neighborhood here. Um, and then you get down to the, I guess the city downtown would be, but see, you know what, again, what concerns me looking at this though, is see the river going in here <clears throat> and this comes in from the Gulf. And uh, see, it flows in. This is all water in here. And all that water is going to funnel in to Lake Charles. And it's going to overflow. I would say, you know, just, and again, uh, you know, pull the uh, NHC surge map up. I mean, it has most of this area going. Let's do that real quick. Uh, see if I have that. See if I can pull up that surge inundation one more time. Yeah, so, okay. It's, yeah, not looking good there. That's, uh, all right, so. Let me do this. Let me screenshot this. All right. Let me open that back up. Okay. So here we are on the NHC surge map. And notice above that lake. Uh, actually, that was Port Arthur we were looking at there. But look at the area right up in here. And. That's all going underwater for the most part. That's uh, anywhere from three to six feet or higher above ground is going underwater. And the NHC 
indicates that uh, that whole area is pretty much going underwater that I just showed you on that map. I mean, that's all, uh, again, we're looking at uh, getting 30 miles off the coast to escape the water. So again, eight, nine feet above water, uh, above ground is going to be underwater. I mean, I, this will be, uh, yeah, the, the red indicates you have to be nine feet above ground. And you're going to get, you're going to have water coming in. Um, so let's go back to the uh, Google Earth and let's compare this. Again, get a visual on that. Get a visual on that map. And let's go to Google Earth. Okay, and let's pan it out. Yeah, that was it. That was Lake Charles we were looking at. So there it is. And that whole thing is going basically underwater. With the exception of, you know, uh, maybe the northern portions, you might have a foot or two of water uh, up in here maybe. But down here, nine feet. Like, it's almost inescapable, even in Lake Charles. This is the danger that's going to await on Thursday morning. Um, and again, that's based on the current forecast track from the National Hurricane Center. So, again, sparsely populated down here, nothing, you know, but it's all going underwater. And... And then we get over here to Beaumont, same situation. So there's Beaumont. Let's get an eyeball on Beaumont. And there's the lake right next to it, or the, the uh, Sabine Pass and the, the potential for the surge to come in. And let's go back to the NHC surge maps. And let's get over here. And there's Port Arthur. Oh, they, they have it... Uh, Oh, it's a levied area, I see. Okay, so southeast of town, southwest of town is the most vulnerable to flooding. And uh, that's interesting. They have a lot of that area levied off. Um, but again, same situation. Look at all the red up in here. Water will be nine feet above ground. Water will be nine feet on those red areas. So, uh, again, go back to Google Earth, and there it is. So, you got all this area flooding up in here, all up in here, vulnerable, and all down in here, vulnerable to flooding. And, uh, you know, and then when you get out in here, it's maybe a foot or two of water. But that's how far inland that water is going to get. It's amazing. I mean, this is, it, it's just not advisable like as a storm chaser. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it just doesn't seem logical. So... But I mean, to be on the beach, there's just nothing there. There's nothing on the coast. I mean, even down here, when you get into the, you know, towards Intracoastal City. I mean, this is Intracoastal City's over in here. You know, tiny little villages and whatnot. I mean, it's not. There's not really much infrastructure there. So, the main population area is Lake Charles. Over to the Beaumont area, those are your high population areas, and those are, you know, hopefully most of the people got out of there because a lot of this area is going underwater. Scary stuff. Okay, so let me show you the um, population in these areas. And...
go to my trusty maps. I'm hoping some of these population centers uh, tallies are still on the maps because we had to eliminate some stuff. Uh, let's see, main map. Yep. And let me screen capture this. Okay, so I'm going to show you the recon again in just a minute. We're awaiting the 11 p.m. advisory. It's 10.35 Eastern time. Jim Williams, Hurricane City here, talking about the future track of Laura. Yeah, so here we go. There's population density maps on these maps when you zoom in. And you click on it, for example. Why isn't it working? Oh, you know what? It was probably disabled. Or maybe I'm frozen here. I don't know which is called. Oh, there we go. Never mind. Lake, uh, there we go. Okay, we got, whoops, keep zooming in. Okay, we got 32,000 housing units at Lake Charles. Uh, population 72,479. Uh, that's a lot of people. I mean, you're talking 100,000 plus in this whole area up in here. So 100,000, and then you get down to the, uh, the Cameron area, not too much population, uh, 709. Total population, 1256. Wait a minute. I, maybe I was reading the wrong thing up here. Let me go back. Yeah, population 72479 at Lake Charles. So that surrounding area, about 100,000 people. Now, if you head over here to Beaumont, I mean, Port Arthur area, we've got 54,873. And up in Beaumont, we've got 119,282. I think in Beaumont, it's going to be a little safer than Port Arthur. So we're still talking, you know, probably close to another 100,000 just in that area alone. Um, you know, I think a lot of these people got out. I'll tell you what, based on the surge maps, there's going to be a lot of people that at the very least, they're going to have water coming into their, at least a foot deep in their house, if not more, the closer you get to the water areas going under. I wouldn't be there. If I had a house right on that um, Texas-Louisiana border there, I'd, I'd get out of Dodge. All right, let's get to the uh, latest reconnaissance and see if we have any late data on the recon. We had 984. No, we have no new vortex message yet. Okay, we got 984 millibars. So again, some of those models I was showing you earlier weren't even at 984. They were like nine, you know, 989, 990, like the Canadian, for example. Um, not even right on where what the pressure would be where it is right now. So uh, the models are only as good as where they said it would the pressure would be right now, as far as intensity is concerned, as to where it's going to be when it makes landfall. Let's check the uh, see if there's any buoys around over here. It's another map I made that has the layers built on top of the buoys. So you can see the the uh, the cone on top of and the current position on top of where the buoys and the ships are out here. So let's see. Uh, there's a buoy just northwest of the center, and it's pressure 35 knots, gusting to 46. Pressure 29.55 inches. So that's uh, about a thousand millibars, thousand millibars just northwest of the center of circulation. And what are the winds there again? Northeast. 
Yeah, that would make sense. Northeast winds 35 knots out in front of it. And we're talking, that's about 35, 40 miles from the center that they're getting winds out of the northeast at 35 knots. So again, it, again, it, it's attributed to the small size of this, like compared to um, Rita. Uh, so look at how small that hurricane force wind field is too, by the way. That little red circle is the hurricane force wind. So it's not really blossomed just yet. See some of these other buoys out here. Uh, northeast winds, light, 1.9 miles an hour. Really? Wave heights, 11, 11 foot waves. Got 23 knot winds out of the northeast, east northeast. And this is about 90 miles northwest of the center. They got these oil platforms out here, but they don't usually report. And then, you know what's fun? Do you always see a couple of ships out here? I just got finished reading the book. Um, oh, what's the name of that book? Let me see. Oh, The Raging Sea by Rachel Slade. And uh, let me show you that to you. So, so this book, Into the Raging Sea, is about the uh, the ship called the El Faro that was sailing from Jacksonville to Puerto Rico into Hurricane Joaquin when it was a Category Four, and that ship, the the captain, for whatever. You know, I don't know. It's speculative because everybody died on the ship. There was like, I don't know, 18 crew members or something that died. Uh, the captain decided to core punch it. I mean, he didn't, he deviated a little bit off his course, but he didn't, he just was basically saying to the crew, based on what eyewitness and radio reports and open microphones and from the black box and everything, that he kind of thought that it was a, this was like the Aleutian Sea, and this was crab fishing, and I guess he felt that the ship could core punch through that. So they were on the southwest quad of Joaquin, and the seas were like 50 feet. And this ship was like a thousand, you know, like 800 feet long or something. And what happened was the ship was old, and a lot of the, uh, what do they call those, the, the sealed you know, where they use the the thing that rotates and uh, what are they called? Bulkheads? Bulkhead uh, containers were not sealed tight. And the water was pouring into the ship. And the captain was up there. First of all, the captain was sleeping all night. He should have been awake. Um, there was all kinds of arguing and bickering. There were people like were... And, and they, they come to, anyway, at the end, of the, the end of the story was, well, the ship sunk to the bottom of the uh, ocean in the in the Bahamas. Everybody on board was never found. There were three, I think there were, no, nobody was found alive. I don't, no, nobody was found alive. The ship cracked in half. And in this book, uh, there was an investigation by the Coast Guard and the maritime authorities and the, the owners of the ship, uh, which was the, the tote company own that ship and they're of course blame, claiming we didn't know anything we you know they never communicated with us blah 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 possible but the ship uh they didn't have a system in place and, and this is a new rule they have now these ships have um a emergency phone now on the ships where if a crew member thinks that the captain is being reckless and driving into a hurricane, they can call for help. And that's something they didn't have on the ship. Uh, but the open microphone, I would love to hear the recordings, but you can't hear it in a book. But apparently, they could hear all the ship going down and all the chaos that was happening on the on the recordings, the, the microphones that were inside the, the uh, you know, where the captain's quarters are or whatever, where they, where they you know, the pilot the ship. All that was caught on audio as the ship was going down. So that must have been phenomenal. I mean, could you imagine being the owner of that company, Tote, 
and being the Coast Guard, and the family members were there in that meeting, and they had to listen to that ship going down on open mic. This, a book you should read. Um, another book that's really phenomenal is The Ship in the Storm by Jim Carrier. That's my favorite of all time. And uh, if I can find it, i got so many books that I've read on Hurricane. Let's see. Uh, oh, The Ship in the Storm. You know what? I might have given it to somebody because I'm so generous. <laughs> uh, I've read Isaac Storm. I've read uh, the... Uh, Rise of a Media Phenomenon, the Weather Channel story. I've read about the Hurricane Katrina book that was out. Uh, you know what? I don't have that book. Uh, it was it was called The Ship in the Storm. It was about the ship called the Phantom that went down in Hurricane Mitch in 1998. And Jerry Gerald, I've had him on the shows, and Jerry Gerald was the director of the Hurricane Center at the time, and he said that that was a fiasco beyond they didn't listen the ship decided to sail south and west uh, thought they could take harbor mitch turned to the south and the rest is history the ship disappeared they never found anybody alive uh pieces of the ship they found little pieces here and there but there was nothing left um again a captain that takes it upon himself and, and you know, that's why i was just showing you the maps like those maps oftentimes show ships that are heading right toward the hurricane. In fact, when Laura was, when Laura was, yeah, when Laura just got into the Gulf of Mexico, earlier today I was looking at the maps, and there were two ships just to the southwest of Laura. They were like side by side, and they were, I guess they were hedging their bets, like, okay, if the hurricane gets a little more that way, we're going to go this way. Like, but it's interesting to see how close the ships. Let me see if there's any out there. Who are their closest ships? Never going to get that advisory from the Hurricane Center, but uh, let me um, see if there. Yeah, there's one ship down here. Look at it. There they are. Those are the same two ships that were there this morning when when uh, Laura was back in here somewhere. So here's what the ships are reading right now. Pressure 2973 and rising. Uh, there's no wave heights. Uh, here we go. Dominant wet, 10 foot waves. Uh, pressure 2979, visibility 5 miles. So they're not bad, but they got some pretty high waves there. 10 foot waves out of the southwest. Uh, they got winds, well, the winds are out of the southwest at 10, but they've got 10 foot waves uh, hitting those ships down there right now. That's not bad. But still, it's a little risky, I think, depending on what kind of ships they are. Here's another ship out here, just to the west, uh, pressure 29.78, and following no wind or wave information. Um, see if there's any other ships north. No. All oil rigs. Most of these oil rigs have been evacuated. Shell oil, no observations, no. These are fun to play with these maps, though. You can, all right, so let's look at the tides real quick. Um, there's another GIS map I built that shows the, the, the tide uh, for, for all the tide uh, for the major harbors. And let's zoom in on it. Um, well, you don't really need to zoom that. Let's take Houston, for example. High tides will be at uh let's see we're talking um low tide 17, 17 4, that's two, uh 1 p.m on no that's the 28th wait a minute 8 26 no it doesn't go out to when it goes out to tomorrow afternoon low tide is at 2 p.m so we it doesn't go out far enough but this is another thing you can use on the maps at Hurricane City. You can find the tide data. Um, all right, so anything else I want to show you before we go to the Hurricane Center? Oh, there's quickly, here's the five-day graphical outlook. Nothing. Uh, a couple models are predicting something out in the middle of the 
Atlantic, and they kind of turned northwest, not coming toward the U.S., so we're going to get a little bit of a reprieve here for a little while. Um, oh, let me quickly, yeah, I might as well show you my predictions. Uh, here, here were my predictions. Before the season started, uh, number one was the Cancun area. It's already been impacted by two systems this year. Uh, number five was Brownsville. They were impacted by Hannah. Um, I got Houston, Galveston, number nine up here. That could be impacted by Laura. Number eight was Isle of, uh, I mean, uh, Grand Isle, Louisiana, and Grand Isle was not impacted by Marco, so that's uh, that's a no-go. Um, Cabo Corrientes already impacted by Laura. Manzanillo impacted by Laura. Cayman Islands impacted by Laura. Uh, Oviedo by Laura. And uh, we, of course, we already had Easy Aeus, uh, number 18, 11, 12, and 6 were impacted. So most of my top 20 has already been impacted. But some of you might be looking at this map going, well, wait a minute, you got these. You, you picked everything like you got you got every city picked uh, evenly. Those of you that pay attention to my predictions know that some years I have them tightly clustered and other years I have it more spread out. But what you have to pay attention to when you look at these maps is the areas that have not been impacted so far that I did not indicate were going to be impacted. Uh, let's take a look at. Uh, well, let me clear this. Let's take a look. Okay, areas that have not been impacted that I did not think were going to be impacted this year. Look at this. The whole mainland Mexico, I, did, I have nothing over here. I have nothing down here in the Central Caribbean, you know, the, the Central American coast. Uh, I have nothing for the Keys or Southwest Florida. So far, nothing. I have nothing for the entire East Coast of Florida. I have nothing for the panhandle of Florida, the Big Bend. I have nothing for the central Texas coastline, even though I do have it for north and south, which are going to have both been impacted. Um, northeastern Caribbean, southwestern, southeastern Caribbean, not really much. So it's not just what I pick, it's what I don't pick that you also have to pay attention to. So I think I've done pretty well, considering we're a little more than halfway through the season. All right, let's go check the NHC. Um, let's get NHC Laura information, see if we have the latest advisory yet on Hurricane Laura. Okay, here we go. Public advisory, Laura is... Um, Oh, let me go ahead and screen capture this. Okay, so Laura continues to strengthen. We have uh, 655 miles southeast of Lake Charles, Louisiana. So that's what the Hurricane Center is kind of focusing on. And 430 miles southeast of Galveston. Maximum winds 90. That's up 5 miles an hour. Uh, present movement west northwest at 300 degrees. That's a little more to the right at 17 miles per hour. And we have pressure 978 millibars. That's quite a bit lower. Pressure 2888. They must have gotten an additional information from the recon because I didn't see that in the uh, drop zone. I mean, in the uh, vortex message, which is a drop zone. Uh, so 978. Here we go. Okay, let's see, hurricane warnings, no hurricane warning, wait a minute, hurricane warning in effect from San Luis past Texas to intercoastal city, Louisiana. So I guess that does not include, I would have to look at the maps. Let's get to the discussion. Laura's cloud pattern is becoming better organized on satellite images, and this is from uh, Richard Pash. 
I thought he retired, no? Well, maybe I'm thinking of the other guy. Uh, I thought it was Richard Pash. Oh, well. Anyway, um, it's getting better organized with a banding feature over the eastern portion of the circulation and an expanding central dense overcast with cloud tops of minus 80 degrees Celsius or colder. The upper level outflow is becoming better established over the northwestern quadrant. Flight level and SFMR observed surface winds from the hurricane hunters indicate that the maximum winds have increased to 80 knots and the central pressure is falling. The hurricane is expected to remain over SSTs near 30 degrees Celsius until it nears the coast with only moderate vertical shear. The ship's rapid intensification index shows a significant probability for 25 to 30 knot increase in strength during the next 24 hours. So that would be uh, 90, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's 110, that's, that's major hurricane. And this is reflected in the official forecast. This is also between the simple and corrected intensity model consensus predictions. Laura will weaken rapidly after landfall, but it will likely bring hurricane force winds well inland over extreme western Louisiana and eastern Texas. Aircraft and satellite fixes show a continued west-northwest track with an initial motion estimate near 300 degrees at 15 knots. The track forecast reasoning has not changed. The hurricane should gradually turn to the northwest and north over the next day or two as it moves around the western periphery of a mid-level ridge uh, uh, high and into the weakness into the subtropical ridge. Later in the forecast period, the cyclone should turn toward the east-northeast and move with increasing forward speed <clears throat> while, in, while embedded within the westerlies. The official track forecast is similar to the previous one and is also very close to the simple and corrected consensus track model predictions. All right, so they're predicting it's going to get up to 120. So let's open up the her track and show you the actual animation of this. And while I'm waiting for that to open up, it is currently 11, almost 11 o'clock, 9.56. Okay, we have a 90 mile an hour hurricane predicted to be 120. And I'm going to zero it in here on the her track so that you can uh, see the details of the wind field and the time of arrival and exactly where this is coming in. So takes a minute to load here. Once I get it loaded up, I'll screen capture it and run the animation. And then we're going to call it for the night. For those of you that wonder about this program, it's called the uh, it's based it's made by uh, uh, PC Weather Products. It's called the Hertrack Pro, and uh, I'm running the 2017 version. Uh, Richard Sambatero makes this program. It's been around for years. All the professionals use it. Uh, really good for narrowing in, you know, the wind fields and all the details. There's so much stuff on here. Um, when you donate to Hurricane City, from time to time, I'll, I'll pass these graphics along to the mailing list, some of them, when I have time. And uh, I like to run this program because with Hurricane City, I get into the details on cities, and so I need to know exactly how far it came from each city in the database. So when I, when I, when I show you this map, it's going to show all the cities that I have in my database. And then it, when I run the animations, it, it's able to calculate how far away from each city and how far the wind fields impacted it. So that's how I narrow, narrow everything down. And then I cross-reference it with the National Hurricane Center's wind history maps. So I, I got it nailed down. I mean, there's... Hardly anything that gets by me on the on the wind fields. Occasionally, though, they'll, the Hurricane Center will claim that there were tropical storm force winds in a particular location when all the data that I've scoured through, I couldn't find anything. And that includes the Weather Flow Network, the Weather Underground, the, the, the official 
airport measurements and everything. And sometimes I just can't get um, find anything to show tropical storm force winds. So sometimes I'll leave a city off that list that may show that it was impacted by tropical storm force winds. And the Hurricane Center does reanalysis uh, after the, you know, they do final reports on each system. Sometimes they might back off on a city or two. So it's really micromanaged data. And that's why I'm so proud of that database. It is really accurate. Like, if you want to know your city, the hurricane history of your city going back 150 years with all the wind fields and everything, it's the best place to go to narrow it down. All right, here's the latest. Okay, so first of all, all right, all right, so, um, All right, so notice all the cities highlighted on the map. Those are all my in my database. And Port Arthur is actually uh, Grand I uh, Lake, uh, not Lake Charles. Cameron should be on this map too. That's just below Port Arthur, right below, right, right here on the southwest coast of Louisiana. So here we are. Uh, the core. Winfield arrives at 11 p.m. on tomorrow night. 11 p.m. tomorrow night, that red circle infringes on the coast, which is hurricane force winds. Then the donut core with the eye wall arrives at midnight. 1 a.m. the eye gets there. 2 a.m. the backside eye wall, assuming it's not the bat look and it's hollow, it's it's got actual convection around it would be coming in, and then it begins to clear out of the area at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock, tropical storm force winds start to calm down, and by 8 o'clock in the morning, things should be calmed down in uh, all these impacted areas. So it's going to be devastating starting at 11 p.m. tomorrow night. And here we go. There, There's that, okay, 120 mile an hour winds. I passes right on, and somebody asked me on, on Facebook uh, yesterday, I think, how, how high do you think this is going to get up? And I said probably 120, and I'm thinking uh, west of intercoastal city, Louisiana is what I said. Um, and, you know, this track could shift a little further east, who knows, uh, by tomorrow night. But, or it could shift to the west, but right now it looks like the worst, that you know, based on this advisory, uh Galveston would get under the tropical storm force gust wind field, but not the sustained. So again, Galveston, Houston area would be gust to tropical storm. From west, just northeast of the Bolivar Peninsula, to include Beaumont, Port Arthur, would get gust to hurricane force. And Port Arthur, I mean, uh, yeah, Port Arthur, Texas to Cameron and Lake Charles would get the full brunt of this. Then over here toward Intracoastal City, they would get gusts sustained at hurric uh, tropical storm force, some gust of hurricane force. And then east of there over toward maybe Morgan City would get some gusts to tropical storm, uh, but nothing for New Orleans, nothing for Grand Isle. Nothing over here south of Galveston or Freeport or anything. It's just going to be between Galveston and Intracoastal City and Morgan City at the very outside edges. It looks like this is going to be. Um, and again, if we look at the hurricane force wind field on the discussion forecast advisory, we're talking... At landfall, again, 40 miles northeast of the center. Yeah, so they're staying. It's going to be a little more than it was at 5 p.m. 40 miles northeast of the center. Hurricane force winds, 40 miles northeast of the center. 
uh, 30 miles southeast, 30 miles southwest, 40 miles northwest. So, yeah, they're predicting the north side hurricane force wind field is going to stick out farther than the south side of the circulation is. So, that's it. A little bigger than it was at 5 p.m. Not much, just a tad bigger, but still about half the size of Rita. Uh, same strength as Rita, 120. And we'll see if that increases between now and tomorrow night. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here, folks. Uh, appreciate you watching tonight. I'm Jim Williams. I'll will not I will not be live tomorrow night because I got to get some rest, and it's all going to go down. Midnight, uh, one o'clock, two. You know what? I might. Who? I might. I got to get with my co-broadcast here, uh, Bill, and see if he wants to do. We could maybe do an 8 p.m. show or 9 p.m. show, and then just lead it right into the 11 p.m. advisory, and then start the coverage right from there, because this is when it's all going to start around 11 midnight tomorrow night. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you for watching. Appreciate all the support and everything, and. Uh, We'll see you back here tomorrow night for coverage of this landfalling major hurricane, Laura, on the western Louisiana coastline. Good night, everybody. Jim Williams. Take care.